you are listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. Sustainable World Radio brings you in-depth interviews, news, and commentary about positive solutions to environmental challenges. Solutions that adhere to the permaculture ethics of earth care, people care, fair share. Are you interested in learning more about permaculture projects around the globe? How to plant a food forest? Restorative design or ethnobotany? Then stay tuned for Sustainable World Radio. I'm your host and producer, Jill Cloutier. My guest today is Courtney White, author of the new book, Grass, Soil, Hope, A Journey Through Carbon Country. A former archaeologist and activist, Courtney White co-founded the Quivera Coalition, a nonprofit dedicated to building bridges between ranchers and conservationists around practices that improve land health. Courtney is the author of Revolution on the Range and the Indelible West, an online collection of black and white photographs of the American West. Courtney White lives in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and if you want some good news about climate change solutions, this will be a great episode for you to listen to. Congratulations on your new book, Courtney White. Um, It's entitled Grass, Soil, Hope, A Journey Through Carbon Country, and it's great to have you on the program. Well, Jill, thank you very much. I I really appreciate the opportunity to, to talk to you. You just mentioned that we met right when you were starting your journey in writing this book which is really exciting. And now here it is, a finished project. And I think it's perfect timing for a world hungry for solutions about climate change. Yeah, it's been about a about a three-year process for me. It actually extends all the way back to 2009 when I was uh, given a publication by the World Watch Institute called Mitigating Climate Change Through Food and Land Use. And we, we may have talked about this before, but that one, that that particular publication, which it's the first one I ever saw that really linked um, atmospheric carbon dioxide and the you know the challenges we have up there with soil and food and animals and uh, that was that was a revelation for me and then that was the first step on this journey through carbon country and that's one thing I want listeners to know is that carbon country is not over there it's right. not far it's not just ranching and and farming and, and gardening we're gonna learn all about carbon in this interview right. Your book talks a lot about carbon, which to me has always kind of been climate change's poster child. It's really bad. It's a pollutant. Can you tell our listeners a bit about why carbon, when it's in the quote wrong place, is causing climate change? And then in soil, it can actually be a boon and a positive thing. Yeah, and, and this was was news to me when I first started out on this journey because you know, like many folks, I, I assume carbon was largely the bad guy. You know, we have too much of it in the form of carbon dioxide up in the atmosphere. Uh, we have a war against carbon. We talk a lot about a post-carbon economy. We have to get beyond carbon, and uh, and it wasn't until I, I began to look a little bit into the uh, into the sequestration side of things. And sequestration is just kind of a fancy word for storage, where we can store carbon. Um, in this case, in the soils, uh, through uh, photosynthesis and plant roots. Um, until I started looking into that, I didn't realize how much hopeful news was out there. You know, again, I assumed everything was just like, ah, oh, it's awful. And uh, what I found um, through the research and through the through the journey and talking to all these carbon pioneers kind of around the country, is that carbon is actually part of the solution as well as part of the problem. And that's, it's the same element. It's still number six on the periodic chart. It's, you know, one of those basic, common, uh, essential elements to life on the planet. Uh, too much, it's kind of like the Goldilocks principle. Too much of it, and we get into trouble. Too little of it, we get into trouble. But just right, uh, uh, we have life on the planet. Mm-hmm. In fact, um, there's, and, and, and listeners should dig into this a little bit if they want, is uh, try to understand the, uh, the carbon cycle. Uh, it's a great life-giving cycle on the planet, how carbon moves around from the atmosphere to the oceans to trees to plants to soils and back up again, round and round and round. Earth has this, um, it's kind of like a big thermostat, how it kind of uh, uh, handles too much of this or too much of that, too warm, too cold, by moving this through this carbon cycle. And, uh, and the main driver on the 
short side of that cycle, the quick cycle, is plants. You know, just old green plants, uh, trees, vegetables, shrubs, grasses, everything that's green uh, is, is doing photosynthesis. And this is, uh, this is nature's original green energy. Uh, it's uh, as low tech as it comes. It, uh, and it scrubs CO2 out of the atmosphere by draws it, drawing it into plants, breaking that C off of the CO2, putting the O2 back out as oxygen. The C, the carbon, uh, goes many places in a plant, uh, but a lot of it ends up in the soil through the roots where it's stored. And that way you get a hopeful answer to our too much carbon in the atmosphere by putting more of it in the soil where it's stored for a long period of time, hopefully. I think I've read that a lot of the carbon in the atmosphere was originally in the soil. Yeah, you know, this was this was a kind of a big surprise to me. When I, uh, even though I have a background in archaeology, um, when I read that many climate scientists uh, kind of point their finger at uh, uh, the first farming, you know, nine, eight, thousand years ago is really kind of the start of our climate problem because when you when you uh, start turning uh, dirt over you start exposing soil the carbon in the soil to the atmosphere to the air to heat light that kind of stuff the carbon in the soil goes back up into the atmosphere and uh, when we started using the plow extensively about 5,000 years ago and there's a famous hieroglyph of a plow a guy in a plow on an Egyptian temple um, when we started plowing extensively, we started releasing a lot of stored carbon back in the atmosphere. And they can actually trace uh, the kind of the climate crisis we have today back to that very, very first period when we started turning over sod and soil and all that sort of stuff and releasing carbon into the atmosphere. I could see that disturbance will make that carbon just go right up. Right. One thing people may not know that I find very interesting, too, is there's actually, I, I believe, four natural sinks for carbon, right? Right, right. In the atmosphere, when it's in balance, it's fine. But now that we have this overabundance in the atmosphere, that's causing us some climate problems. Can you tell our listeners, too, about the other sinks for carbon and where it's a benefit and where it's not? Yeah, there's, in the, in the big carbon cycle, there are really four large reservoirs of carbon or where carbon can go. So the atmosphere is one, you know, we've got too much carbon up there in the form of carbon dioxide. So it's kind of overflowing in a sense. Another big reservoir is the oceans. Uh, oceans can uh, absorb carbon, carbon dioxide in, into the water. Uh, and that's a problem right now because it's beginning to fill up and acidify. And this is a concern for a lot of reasons. Uh, if the oceans get filled up too much with carbon, then we got some problems. And it was seen as a positive. Oh, the oceans can just handle it. This is great. For a while. And, and you know, again, a little bit of the Goldilocks principle here. It's good for a while, and then it gets to be too much. And then, then problems start to ensue. And don't forget, we're at a, a parts per million, CO2 parts per million, um, highest in 5 million years, something like that. So it's, you know, the carbon cycle's working hard here to kind of balance things out. So oceans are number two. The third reservoir are forests, uh, trees, particularly tropical forests. Uh, trees are a great carbon sink, meaning they absorb a lot of carbon dioxide through photosynthesis. They store it in, in the trunks and the branches and the leaves and the roots and soil. So, so, and a lot of attention has been paid over the years to forests, particularly from conservationists and regulators and policymakers trying, trying to protect our forests, trying to keep them alive and healthy and absorbing all that CO2. Um, and the fourth reservoir is soils. And this is the one that kind of gets overlooked all the time. And one of the reasons why I wrote my book was to try to pay attention, bring attention to soils. Um, and they've actually done the math. Uh, the soils around the planet could absorb more CO2 than all the forests and potentially as much as the atmosphere uh, can hold. Um, it's a really a great place to store carbon underground if you don't disturb it, if you don't um, overgraze the land or plow it up, you know, that kind of stuff, and release that carbon back up. It can be sequestered and stored there for a long, long time. So those are the four big reservoirs. Carbon cycles through them. Right now, one's overflowing, one's filling up. Uh, forests are important, um, but they're not the only answer. We got to we got to work with soils at some point. Mm -hmm. And your the title of your book is Grass Soil Hope. You didn't call it Plants Soil Hope. <laughs> why why are right. grasses singled out as 
in, in the title of your book? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, partly because my background is working with ranchers, uh, working in grasslands, partly because grasslands are the largest terrestrial land uh, type. I mean, there's more grasslands on the planet than forests, for example. Um, and um, and grass gets overlooked. You know, we, we at forests are, are big and beautiful. Uh, grasses are grasses, right? You know, they just <laughs> extend off to the horizon. They wave in the wind. You I know, think and most so we, people think of lawns when they think lawns, of grass. Lawns, <laughs> yeah. We're not, uh, yeah, we're know, not. They're, it's they're, not that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a grass lawn is absorbing CO2 as well. But we're, when you're talking about scale, you're talking about uh, natural um, habitats, natural landscapes. We're talking about rangelands or grasslands. And grass, what's neat about grass is that it's uh, it's a perfect example of resilience in nature. And resilience just means to, to bounce back after something. And you think about a storm or a fire or something that happens, a big herd of bison going through, grass bounces back. It's resilient. It comes back even after a drought. If you get a good rainstorm, it'll come back. So grass, it, it has lots of potential to, to solve our problems. It can feed a lot of animals and wildlife, and it's resilient. It hangs in there, uh, and it's, it just extends, you know, to the horizon, and uh, is generally overlooked by humans looking who, you know, we like to look at the charismatic this is and that, <laughs> and just kind of look right over the grass. Aren't grasses long-lived as well? Yeah, well, you know, an individual grass plant is probably not uh, long-lived, but with grasslands themselves, uh, they have the ability to regenerate themselves and go on and on and on. It kind of depends on where you are. And so I, I believe, and I, I, you correct me if this is wrong, that two-thirds of the earth is covered in grassland. So is the management, is the potential for that land right. to sequester and hold carbon? But yeah, you know, at, when I first got started in this, I, I saw some math done by some soil scientists looking at rangelands. And what they said was if, they, if you could increase the, the carbon content, the, the amount of carbon in the soils of grasslands around the world, kind of wave a magic wand and just increase the carbon content, by only 2%, uh, you, they did the math, and you could soak up a whole lot of carbon dioxide and store it in the soils just by raising that carbon content just 2%. And when I first read that, I thought, oh, come on. <laughs> you know, really? Um, and then I looked into it a little bit more, and, and, and it's true. Um, there, are a couple, there are a couple conditions you have to put on it. One, you can't uh, disturb the soil. Once you store it, you gotta you gotta maintain it. It's gotta be healthy rangelands. Number two, drought. Uh, drought is a problem. Drought slows the carbon cycle down. Mm. You know, plants need water to grow, turn green, all that kind of stuff. Uh, where I am, I'm looking at my window right now at my house. At a pretty brown landscape. It's uh, you know we're having a pretty bad drought here. Uh, so uh, so the carbon cycle goes more slowly uh, in dry times, and so then the ability to sequester carbon in soil slows down. So that's a challenge. And then number three, you know, the management of the land, you know, how uh, cattle are managed, uh, how to get grasses to grow um, is also a challenge. You know, there's some poor management out there, some overgrazing, um, but we, we're, we're land is managed well, where cows are respected and, and used positively, uh, you can have lots of healthy range lands, you can restore a lot of degraded land, and you can store a lot of carbon as a consequence. Mm. So, Courtney, maybe tell us a bit about what are some land management strategies for long-term carbon sequestration and sure. holding it yeah. in the soil? Yeah. So the, the book, what I try to do in the book is uh, show uh, different ways to store carbon in soils. And so um, part of it is ranching, part of it is farming, but there's a couple of chapters on uh, ecological restoration as well. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. So um, the ranching part of it is uh, pretty straightforward. If you manage your livestock in a way that uh, grows grass and, and, and fills in bare spots with more grass, um, you know, moves the cows around rapidly, uh, kind of mimicking nature's way of grazing, or natural wild herbivores, the way they kind of move across landscapes. Grass likes grazers, and grazers like grass. They need each other. Uh, it can be it can be bison, pronghorn. It can be you know whatever eats grass, or it can be livestock. Uh, but you got to manage it in a way that. Uh, 
it creates healthy habitat, healthy, healthy grasslands, and then you have good carbon storage in the soils. So it was kind of a kind of a lot there. But so that's uh, that's what we call carbon ranching. It's kind of looking at the landscape, improving it through uh, cattle management and other things. I have a profile of a rancher, uh, Tom Sidwell, out in eastern New Mexico that has been practicing holistic management for 40 years. He took a degraded ranch that he bought in 2003. He's restored it. He's divided it up into smaller paddocks. The cows never stay more than two or three days in each paddock. He's cleared the brush off. He's got grass has come back. He's got uh, his springs are flowing. He's got all kinds of wonderful stuff. And he's storing carbon. He's not, he's not out to store your carbon. He's out to improve the range. Um, so he can run more cows, be more profitable. He does a grass-fed beef operation. He's doing all the right things. And he doesn't call himself a carbon rancher, but that's what he's doing, in, in effect. Uh, he's doing all the right things for other reasons. He's trying to improve the biodiversity of the ranch, trying more forage for his animals, healthy grass for his grass-fed beef, all those great well, more water, better water cycle, all that kind of stuff. And, by the way, uh, you know, he's storing more CO2 in soils. Yeah, I don't think climate change is high on his agenda to think about or talk about, but that, in effect, that's what he's doing. So that's that's one set of practices. Um, farming, as we talked a little bit about before, is um, don't plow, is in, a, in a very simple phrase. Um, plowing, plowing destroys the microbial and biological life of the soil. It turns it over, as I said, and heats it up and exposes it to oxygen and stuff. Um, if you don't plow, and then you have lots and lots of uh, biological activity in the soil. And that's good. That's nematodes, protozoas, earthworms, fungi. Uh, and uh, I write about mycorrhizal fungi, which is they, they hang onto the roots of plants, and they're the carbon barters, or carbon traders, <laughs> back and forth, you know, carbon from the plant into the soil, the minerals from the soil and the plant, water, all that kind of stuff. Fungi, these guys are our heroes, mycorrhizal fungi. However, plowing rips them up, kills them. So no plowing, which means looking at no-till agriculture, and I write a, a, a lot about no-till agriculture in the book, um, which means just what it sounds like, no-till, no plow. Um, I won't get into all the technical uh, d details. It's a chisel drill. They, put, uh, they just cut right through the soil, put the seeds down, and then have a cover crop that grows on top of it. Um, no herbicides uh, and pesticides because we're looking at an organic no-till process, which I describe in the book. So that on the farming side of that, that's it's it's just like ranching. You want a cover crop, you want pasture or grass. In the rancher's case, you want crops, uh, organic crops. In the farming case, uh, whatever keeps the soil covered, the the ground moist, and will get those plants to grow and put down deeper roots. Whatever plant it is, even weeds, um, will store more carbon in the soil. So I should say quickly that microbes and protozoas and all those guys also produce, they belch or fart CO2. It's called respiration. It goes this, this part of that cycle, round and round. Uh, so there is CO2 that comes out of the ground. I don't, I don't want to give folks a sense that all of it's just going straight into the ground. Um, that's just part of having a healthy microbial community under the soil. But you want to store more than gets released. And you can do that uh, with um, organic, uh, deep-rooted plants. So those are two. And then I have a couple of chapters on uh, ecological restoration, kind of fixing creeks and uh, rivers. Uh, There's a whole chapter on Louisiana and the bayous and the wetlands restoration going on down there. Uh, wetlands, peatlands, boglands are the best place to store carbon because that uh, that uh, they grow a lot of vegetation, a lot of organic matter, then decomposes and gets stored under the water and turns into peat or you know, some kind of wetland stuff. Uh, along the coast, they call it blue carbon. Uh, it's not literally blue. Uh, it's just a kind of literary device for being close to the ocean. But uh, you can really store a lot. Of, and they scientists have all figured this out. You can measure it all pretty carefully. They can store a lot of carbon in wetlands, coastal marshes, bayous, mangrove swamps, that kind of stuff. And there's a chapter on New Mexico and restoring these degraded creeks we have. We have a lot of degraded land. And uh, when it degrades, uh, these creeks just become little adobe tubes, you know, shooting water down, downstream. And they, none of it sinks in. But if you, uh, and, and through uh, 
the nonprofit I helped start, we've done a lot of creek work over the years here. Um, when you get creeks to slow down and get that water to sink in through various restoration strategies, uh, green things grow. You know, rushes, sedges, you know, riparian vegetation, uh, they pop up. Um, it's, you know, it's called letting nature do the work. Um, and uh, water slows down, sinks in, those plants grow, they put down roots. Suddenly you're sequestering more carbon than you were before. And there's also a, a short chapter on beavers. Uh, beavers are nature's carbon engineers. Uh, they uh, they do it for free too, which is really cool. <laughs> the microbes too. Uh, microbes. And uh, beavers are they're such co- cool, amazing creatures. Um, they do so many good things. It's such a a travesty what we did to beaver population. They uh, slow water down. They they uh, wet. Uh, riparian areas, they, uh, they, they're drought mitigators, but also they store a lot of carbon in the soils behind their dams. And uh, so it's not just about food. It's not just about farming, ranching. It's also about ecological health uh, and restoration, getting things back into sh- shape ecologically, all of which has um, a, a positive carbon consequence uh, and therefore a positive climate consequence as well. It's amazing. So basically, if we had just done the opposite of what we did, yeah. in a way, it's just interesting to hear like the no-tilling, don't use the chemicals, right. don't right. destroy the wetlands, don't pave over wetlands. I mean, it all, it, right. it makes sense. It's We've had to learn through doing, I guess. Yeah, it, it, it kind of a big irony is that we... Um, we, we we went far away from nature's ideas, and so we, at one point we were all organic farmers, right? All you know, way back, we all eat grass-fed beef. Uh, these these systems were healthy. You know, lots of beavers, uh, uh, livestock were herded. They, you know, they were in bunches of cows before the bar- barbed wire fence came along, kind of chopped up the landscape. So we uh, really unraveled a lot of things in only. 50, 60, 70 years, and now the irony is is that we're going back to those old ideas, but for new reasons, you know, right, new climate, um, trying to feed a lot of people, and we're using new technology, the uh, uh, the scientists, uh, the, the tools they have, the uh, monitoring, the infrared cameras, all the way they measure this stuff is amazing, so it's a really a wedding of old practices coming back and new technology uh, coming together, and a lot of it, as I as I described in one chapter, is being driven by young people who have the skill set. You know, they, you know, they, they know the technology. They can handle the, you know, the software issues. They uh, have the business savvy for dealing with um, integrated and complex enterprises. So it's 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 for someone like me who, a lot of this is a kind of above my pay grade. Uh, it uh, <laughs> it's amazing to kind of watch these guys and girls and everybody else kind of at work on all of this with an amazing facility and smarts and energy. Um, it's, it's, it's hopeful. And so we actually can measure the carbon in the soil. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's, a there's different ways to do it. Some of it, uh, some of it's kind of technical. It kind of depends on what your market is um, for scientists and for certain kinds of um, kind of uh, marketplaces. You need to have a lot of kind of hard data about carbon. If you're uh, an organic farmer and mostly want to know just is there more carbon or less carbon, there's some pretty simple strategies. Uh, gardeners, um, uh, organic gardeners know about uh, soil organic matter, SOM, which is 58% carbon. So you can just measure SOM in your garden and then you know you've got more carbon, that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's um, that's what's neat about carbon. It's It's not abstract. It's a real thing. Uh, it exists. You can measure it. It's an element. Uh, you know, <laughs> you can, uh, you can. There, there. We don't have to scratch our heads and wonder. Well, you know, is it there or not? Uh, it's, it's, it's easy to quantify. To me, this sounds a lot like much more common sense than um, seeding the oceans or those giant right. shields. The, the very high tech solutions to mitigating climate change. This is right. a low tech, but then you said it's married with the technology on the computer to measure. I think right. it makes much more sense. Well, and the other, the other yeah, absolutely. Because and, and all of that stuff is untested. And that's what worries me. I said, okay, well, we're going to do this wild, untested geotechnology. God knows what's going to happen. When, in fact, photosynthesis has been around for 
two billion years, right? And so we, why are we inventing new technology when old technology, or, you know, nature's technology exists? And, um, and what's also really cool is that the uh, practitioners that I described in the book, you know, the ranchers and the farmers and the creek uh, restorationists, they've been at it for 30, 40 years. And, this, and, and they've worked a lot of this out in the field, not, not for the climate, but and they, for their own purposes, for food and for water and stuff. Uh, and that toolbox is really well developed now. It's been beta tested over and over again. It's, it's fairly straightforward. It's practical. It's profitable. It's effective. You know, we know how to fix creeks, for example. You know, it's mm-hmm. you know, we need money and we need labor and we need more opportunity. But the actual ideas and practices for getting in a creek and re-meandering it so it, it's healthy, that's you know. That's been figured out, and that's what's exciting because we don't have to wait for, who knows, Bill Gates to figure this out and you know and give us the word when, in fact, all this stuff already exists. Uh, you, you couple that toolbox to photosynthesis, you know, you know, plus plus equals you know, cool stuff for everybody. We can do it right now. Mm, it's so exciting. Well, it is exciting, but I want to make sure I don't sound overly hopeful only because there are there are challenges i mentioned drought um uh you know some of these practices are controversial in some circles you know um you know, getting environmentalists to understand um cattle ranching is still a challenge in some respects um and you know there are regulatory and policy obstacles into into in the way to doing this kind of at scale and we have to figure out how to make it economical make it an econ- economy out of this you're the psychic interviewee. Those are my next two questions. It's oh, great. Good. Okay. Yeah, so tell us, are there economic <laughs> benefits to this? Do you envision a day when herders, farmers, beavers, ranchers would be paid to be caretakers of carbon yeah. in the soil? Yeah, I do. And I, I spend the last part of the last chapter kind of um, speculating, kind of thinking out loud on what would it take to start a, kind of a carbon economy so we could do these practices at scale in a way that actually makes a difference on the climate. You know, in theory, we can soak up a lot of CO2 in rangelands. In practice, we have to figure out how to incentivize it or make an economy out of it to get more ranchers and farmers to do this work. You know, we have a, we have an industrial food system that is dead set against this, right? It's a chemical, it's an industrial system that doesn't want to think about these issues. So there's, you know, kind of that big, big economy in the way, which is the industrial food system. Um, so at the end of the book, I, I, I just sort of speculate, what, what if we paid a landowner, paid them directly um, for increasing soil carbon? What if, what if you were a landowner and I said to you, if you double the carbon in your soil in 10 years and we sign a contract and I'll pay you, let's say, I don't know, $200,000 and, uh, and uh, you have to show me the, the measurements, you have to do the tests, but as you go along towards that goal, I'll write you a check. Uh, I guarantee you, you'd, you'd think long and hard about how to do this, right? I mean, you'd say, Yahoo, I'm going to figure out how to increase the carbon of my soils. And here's the really cool part. There's nothing that you would do um, to harm the land uh, because that does, harming the land does not increase the soil carbon. If you, Everything you would do to increase soil carbon is is positive is regenerative it's sustainable so that so then you get to choose from your toolbox you say well i want to do this i want to do creeks i want to do you know sheep whatever um that choice would be up to you all your whole goal is to increase soil carbon you get to choose the the path or the method and then you get a check for doing it so that that's that's what i i sort of fantasize at the end of the book we can't do it yet um for a lot of reasons, but if we could, if for some reason, we could actually just pay landowners to increase soil carbon. You know, we have a lot of money in this country, and we spend it on some funny things, to be honest with you. Um, I, I think you could see action pretty quick. Mm, and we need that action very, very quickly. Right. Yesterday. And, <laughs> I know. Courtney, um, it just in the, okay, let's say that the carbon, the soil cannot sequester enough carbon to get us out of trouble and with climate change. There are still so many benefits to taking this approach right. of climate-friendly agriculture, climate-friendly um, livestock management. Yeah, and, and, you know, um, the, the chapter one in the book um, 
profiles uh, the Car Marin Carbon Project up in California, Marin County. And John Wick, you know, he, he likes to say uh, th there are no downsides to this. There are no downsides. So uh, even if you're not soaking up a lot of carbon in your backyard for doing this, however, um, increasing soil carbon has all these uh, other benefits. You know, it it increases plant productivity. So if you're a gardener, anybody's watching or listening to this as a gardener, you know that dark, rich soil in your garden uh, is healthy and productive. Well, that's mostly carbon. You're composting, you know, you're turning the dead plants over, whatever. Um, so you, we can in sustainably increase food production by putting more carbon in the soil. Um, healthy carbon soils aren't hold more water. Uh, they've done the research. Uh, it's, it's, it's riddled with these little micro uh, pockets of air that can hold water. And if you're a gardener, you know that. You know the difference between poor soils and healthy soils in terms of water absorption. So we can hold more water, which is great in a drought. We need, we need more water holding soils. Uh, it, uh, it pulls minerals up. It improves the mineral cycle. We, we haven't talked about this, but if you know, we have a lot of plants today that are mineral deficient, uh, our food system done a pretty good job at ruining the, the mineral content uh, of our soils through chemicals and plowing and all kinds of stuff. Um, plants that are healthy and vigorous and putting down deeper roots will reach minerals in the soils, and we need minerals. They're pulled up uh, into the plant through the fungi that I talked about, and then they're in the plant. So if you're a vegetarian, you eat the plant, and the minerals are in you, or if you're a meat eater, you eat the animal that eats the plants, and the minerals are in you. So it, uh, it's a huge uh, benefit of uh, improving carbon in soils is, uh, is remineralizing the soils and then remineralizing us. So again, like what, like what John said, man, there's no downside to this. And the, the only thing that really boggles our mind is why aren't we doing more of it right now? Maybe because the larger corporations don't see it as a money-making opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, and I talk about that right at the end of the book, too. You're not going to get rich in this system, right? I mean, this is not a way of making a killing. It's not a way of, you know, making a whole lot of money in a real short amount of time. Um, and that's because soil is an abundant resource, not, not a scarce resource. And we make money off of scarcity, like oil, right? You know, less oil there is, more the more a few amount of people make a lot more money. So soil is different. You know, it's, 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 it's abundant, which is great for us. Um, but if you go into this trying to, you know, make, get rich quick, you ain't going to do it. Um, we have to do it for other reasons. You know, the future of humanity would be a good reason, I think. Um, That's almost as good as making tons of money. <laughs> but I don't know, Courtney. I'm going to have to think about that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, if we can make tons of money saving humanity, I, you know that's what the ge geoengineers are thinking about. Oh, we can make, we can make CO two scrubbing machines and sell them for a lot of money. You know, um, so it's a it's a challenge to kind of our economic worldview. This this whole system it looks at land differently, it looks at animals differently, it looks at profit differently. You know, Tom Sidwell, the rancher that I mentioned is a good capitalist. You know, he, he wants, he's making a profit. You know, he puts the profit back in his land. He's not making a ton of profit. He's not rich. He's not, not by Wall Street standards, but he's, he's a happy guy. He's a rich man, if you asked him. He's doing what he wants, and he's improving the land. We just need to figure out how to, you know, make many, many mirror images of Tom and, uh, and his sensibilities and figure out how to kind of spread them all across the land. Mm -hmm. That sounds wonderful. So we, I think you've already said this, but maybe a takeaway for listeners who aren't ranchers, who aren't farmers, what are a couple of things that they can do right now to, in, sure. to help support carbon sequestration in, in our soils? Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, so I have two answers. Um, one kind of uh, short and one a little bit longer. And the short one is, uh, you know, if, just figure out where... Uh, where you can increase soil carbon in your life. You know, if you're a gardener, it's in your backyard. Um, if you know folks who are, are involved in agriculture in some ways, you know, talk to them, encourage them, buy their food, that, that sort of stuff. The, uh, or get involved in some ecological restoration activities. It's, it's, it's kind of a lot going on wherever you are. The longer answer is um, the uh, your, viewer, your listeners can't see it necessarily, but the cover of the book is a map. And the map... We drew it a couple of years ago, um, 
is of the carbon country. It's a kind of a, a idealized landscape. I tried to think of every sustainable, regenerative, positive thing I could think of. And I put it on this map, farming, ranching, creeks. And the idea is that everybody's on the map somewhere. So if you live in a city or you live in the country, if you're a school kid, if you're an artist, if you're a rancher, if you're a birder, uh, if you're a biologist, you know, you, you drive a car somewhere, uh, everybody, uh, biodiesel, I hope, everybody um, it has a place. Everybody's on the map. Everybody lives in carbon country. Carbon is part of our lives. It's uh, essential to life. Uh, we're all eaters, for example. So we all eat food from a carbon landscape. Uh, if you want uh, to think about it that way, where do you get your food from? Is it from a carbon-friendly rancher farm? Is it from a carbon-unfriendly or, you know, destructive feedlot you know those i mean they're so people can plug in right there by asking those questions where am i on that map what role do i play in a carbon landscape what can i do either directly with soil or indirectly through their activities their pocketbooks their behavior you know, that kind of stuff it's not easy because we have a, an economy that still doesn't value this very much so you're gonna have to look around to figure out how to plug in but there are more and more opportunities as time goes by and as more folks understand that carbon is, the, is a good guy, not, not just a bad guy, then I think you'll find those opportunities and we'll all benefit together. If someone is listening right now and thinks, I have to go get Grass Soil Hope, a journey <laughs> through carbon country, where can they find it? And maybe tell us your contact information too. Oh, sure. Uh, the quick answer is it's published by... Uh, Chelsea Green Press, which is um, based in Vermont, and they, they are the, the number one sustainability press in the country. And so I would encourage folks to go to Chelsea, Chelsea Green. Um, the book is there. Also, their whole book list is fabulous. You know, they have all kinds of gardening and farming and uh, stuff. Uh, so, so I would encourage folks to go there and look, look at everything that they publish. But that's where they can find my book directly. My website uh, has a lot of essays and background material, which and it's uh, a westthatworks.com, a westthatworks.com. Um, and the book, of course, you can get in, in bookstores, hopefully your local bookstore. If not, ask them for it. <laughs> yes, good idea. Courtney, we're running to the end of our time. I know you're jetting off to um, the Savory Institute's International Conference in London, I believe. <laughs> we're so, burning some carbon on yeah, the way, unfortunately. Yeah. That's okay. You can... Um, <laughs> do all the things that you've told us to do when you get back. Um, Is there anything I didn't ask you that you would like to share with listeners? Well, I I just want to sort of reiterate that uh, while there are lots of hopeful solutions here, uh, there's still kind of a a big challenge in front of us, which is kind of on the other side of the equation, which is the emissions, greenhouse gas emissions side. Uh, uh, Soil soil carbon is uh, not a silver bullet, and I don't want to give folks the impression it's part of the answer. It's a big part of the answer. It's exciting. But at the same time, we we need to keep our eyes on the prize, which is we can't just keep pumping greenhouse gases up in the air. I mean, there's no mitigation strategy that is going to allow us just to keep doing that. So at some point, we got to get a handle on emissions. And while we do that, uh, we can build up soil carbon for all the wonderful, wonderful things that it does for us and the future. Yes, and it's conserving energy, renewables. It's it's a multi pronged approach. Right. Not just right. like let's just keep burning fossil fuels to like there's no tomorrow, and then expect soil to handle it. It's a two part equation, and uh, and I didn't I didn't think about the second part, which is the soil part, until recently. And uh, I, I hope folks are encouraged and excited to go and learn more. It's great. And uh, Courtney, again, it's a west that works.com. And if you'd like to get the book, it's Chelsea Green Publishing. I, I, I also I also have a blog, which I forgot about, which is where I write more about carbon on the blog than on the website. And it's just called a car, the, the Carbon Pilgrim. Carbon Pilgrim. It's, a, it's on WordPress. If you just type Carbon Pilgrim in, you'll find the blog. And I try trying to keep up to date on carbon developments after the after the book is out. So I'm going to keep the hopefully keep the good news going. Well, thank you so much, Courtney, for your time today, and um, good luck in London. I'm looking forward to it, and I really appreciate the opportunity to to speak with you.
If you'd like to hear more about soil, carbon, and carbon sequestration, and more from Courtney White, he appears in our DVD, The Soil Solution to Climate Change, which is available for instant download and also purchase on Amazon and also at our website, sustainableworldmedia.com. Thanks so much for listening. You've been listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. You can find us online at sustainableworldradio.com and also on iTunes. For more information about permaculture and ecology, visit the Sustainable World Media YouTube channel, where you'll find videos about permaculture, aquaponics, organic gardening, rainwater harvesting, and much, much more. Sustainable World Radio is a listener-supported program. If you like what we do, please consider making a donation to the show. I'm your host and producer, Jill Cloutier, and thank you so much for listening. Mm -hmm.